All right, welcome back to Mr. Post Frame. Today's show, we are gonna talk about how we fasten our buildings down. We get lots of questions on uh, proper fastening, what nails, what screws, all that good stuff. So we're gonna cover all that in this video. But before we get started, don't forget, uh, we have a Patreon group. It's a group uh, where self-builders can be a part of a community of other self-builders. We talk about different topics every month. We have a live every month where you get to ask questions. I answer them. It's a great thing to be a part of if you're thinking about self-building. Also, if you want to design your own post frame home, barnuminium, or shop, garage, reach out to us, design at Mr. Post Frame. We can also help you out with that. But let's go ahead and jump into the show. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna start with the base of our building and we're gonna work our way up. So we're gonna start out, how do we fasten our building to the ground? And if you've watched our show, we use mostly concrete piers. Occasionally we'll use a continuous wall, ICF wall, but most of the time it's piers. So we're just gonna go through that process and how our brackets, which our building is attached to, is secured into these concrete piers. So what we have here is a sono tube. This is a full length one. We do not use a full sono tube unless absolutely necessary. So what we'll do is I'll either buy 12 foot uh, sticks of sono tube, or like in this case, this is from our steel supplier. It's what the uh, coil comes on. And sometimes I can get those from them for uh, really cheap. And then we will cut them down Basically, 13 to 15 inches is what we do, depending on how long long it is. We just try to maximize, but all we really need is 13 to 15 inches of sono tube. So we use a 16 inch auger, which ends up being an 18 to 20 inch diameter hole. These are 20 inch sono tubes, I believe. Yeah, so these are 20 inch. So what we'll do is we'll cut them down this way, then we will cut them down the side. That way when we put them in the hole, we collapse the sono tube like so, put it in the hole, and then we expand it out to fill the hole, and then we pack dirt and gravel around the sides. Um, and that gives us a nice tight connection where we don't have to add any framing. And then to secure that, We'll just use sheet metal screws and run them through the inside. And that locks that together and keeps it from falling in on itself and falling down the hole. It works really well, saves a lot of time. Once we get to that point, we typically will use um, wet set brackets on all of our piers. And then in some places, garage door openings, corners, we'll use dry set. So we'll just talk about those real quick. This is what's gonna hold our building to our foundation. This is a three ply, six inch bracket. So this is a two by six column. These are from Midwest Perma Column. I use all of their stuff on our builds. Um, this is the SWP63. So like I said, it's a three ply, two by six column. And so when we pour our concrete, we will come back um, once it's set up just the right amount and we will set these down into the concrete where it's flush with the top of our pier. Now, we get lots of questions on, um, do these have to be perfectly centered? And the, the answer to that is no. They have to be full bearing, okay? So what that means is you can't have your bracket hanging off the side. You need a minimum, I believe I'd have to look at the specs, but I think it's somewhere around two and a half inches of concrete between the edge and your rebar. So you could have it set there. It's really difficult to get these perfectly in the center throughout your whole build. If you hit a rock, it might jar your auger over a little bit. So if you're like this, you're fine. If you're like this, you're fine. Um, so just keep that in mind. But this is what's gonna hold your building to the ground. So once that's set, we let the concrete set up and then we'll come back and build. And then our columns get set in here. And I'll show you 
uh, the fasteners that we use to hook our wood to our bracket. When we order our brackets, I will order the hardware kit with it. And I like this because they come in bags. It's everything I need to connect my column to this bracket. So I'll cut it open and kind of show you how that works. So the first thing we're going to be using are these um, structural lags. And that is so there's four holes. There's two on each side. And they, they stagger. So at the top, this one's on this side. And on the other side, it's on that side. And this is so you can plumb your column and then you use these lags to get it set. So there's four of these, comes in the hardware kit. And then once you get your whole wall built, you can come back with your through bolts. Um, the washer goes on first. You drill a hole through your column. This will slide all the way through. And then you have a lock nut. Screw that on. And then you actually tighten it from this side because that's a lock nut. So that lock nut will grip the metal and then it will suck that bracket tight around that column. And you do one at the top and one at the bottom. And this is an incredibly strong connection. You get lots of people to say, oh, post frame's weak. It is not the case. It is very, very strong. And this building would fail exactly where a building that has its post in the ground would fail. And that's that point above the ground where you're gonna get lateral uh, movement and it's gonna snap the column if you were to have a tornado. And at that point, it is what it is. Um, these are These brackets are all rated higher than the uh, International Building Code requires. We actually have a specific video on these that you can check out. We'll leave a link in the, on the screen right now. But this is typically what we use on all our buildings. And then I'll show you what we use for our corner posts and our garage door openings. So this right here is what they call a universal bracket. This, from, this is from Midwest Permacolumn as well. And this is a dry set bracket. Typically we'll use these on our corners and garage door openings. I have started to use an actual wet set bracket on the corners and then I cut half of the bracket off. Um, I like that rebar connection. But again, these are above and beyond the shear strength and uplift strength that you need. So how these work is your column gets set right here. You butt this up to it. Again, it's got two holes for your structural lags to initially attach it. And then what we use on these is a through bolt with a carriage head. And then they, if this is the outside of the building, the column would be here, bracket would be on the inside, and then this would get put through that. And then you suck this until it's flush with the wood. That way it doesn't in interfere with any of your trims, your grade board, any of your metal. It sits flush with the column and uh, gives you a nice strong connection. One thing to think about when you are planning on using these, say this is a garage door opening and you, as you're laying out, you know your column uh, needs to be at a certain place. You need to offset your column a little bit, a couple inches on your pier so that you have plenty of room to attach this bracket to the concrete. And how we attach this, initially we will use Tapcon. They're the blue concrete anchors. Uh, I think they're 3 16 inch. So you set that up against your column where you want it, drill, run those in, and then we have a Simpson tie a screw anchor that actually holds this bracket down. And that's, I believe, a 5 8 inch uh, drill is what you need for that uh, hammer drill. And then that holds that in the concrete like so. And you do have a little adjustment back and forth with this. Um, if you need to, you could always pull those out and adjust this bracket a little bit if need be. But that'll sit down. If you imagine that's the top of the concrete, this is going six inches down into the concrete. And these do not need adhesive. Um, you can just drill your hole, make sure it's good and clean. This column would fail before this uh, screw anchor would come out. One nice thing, um, whether you need a four ply column, three ply column, two by six, two by eight, 
they have hardware kits for all of the, your needs. Uh, we actually have a wet set bracket that is a six by six. We use that on our porches all time. So that will come with a different size hardware kit. But if you guys are interested in those, you can reach out to us. We can uh, hook you up with a good deal on these brackets. But that is how we attach our building to our foundation. And it's a really good uh, solid foundation and it's built to last. You don't ever have to worry about post rot, anything like that. So I guess let's go ahead and talk about how we connect our girts um, and purlins and all that to our building structure. All right, so for those of you who have watched our show, you know that we build our walls on the ground. Um, and whether you build them on the ground or you put your columns up and then build your walls in the air, you're gonna use the same nails um, as long as you're using standard girts. If you're gonna use bookshelf girts, uh, you would just use um, a standard framing nail, three and a quarter inch framing nail. But we're gonna talk about the way we build. Typically that's how post frame is done and that's with the standard girts on the outside. So we'll lay out, we use two by sixes, two by six girts, and we use a 30D ring shank nail. And this is hot dipped galvanized, um, protects against corrosion, um, rust, all that kind of good stuff. So this is it. We use the four and a half inch. Uh, four inch is enough. Uh, we use the four and a half inch. We keep hand drives on us uh, just so if we got to add a nail somewhere, we have single nails. But typically we will use our jumbo nailer, our Fasco jumbo nailer. And these are the nails that go in that actual nail gun. And these are the same thing. These are four and a half inch ring shank, hot dipped, galvanized nails. Now, if you ask yourself, how many nails do you put per connection? So if I have a two by six going across a column and there is no uh, break in that board, I'll put three of these nails. So I'll do it kind of at a diagonal across, one in the middle, one on each corner. And then where there is a connection where two by two, two by sixes meet up, I run two into each board. So you'll have four in that uh, area right there. And these are incredibly strong. Once these things are in, if you have to pull that board off, uh, you are going to rip the nails through the board before these will come out. So we have, um, if we ever have to do take these off, what I'll do is I'll usually cut the heads off with a grinder. Uh, and that way we can just pop the board off without damaging the board. One thing to pay attention to when you are nailing into the column, and this isn't crucial, but this is something I just keep in the back of my head when I'm nailing, is I wanna make sure then when I nail, I'm going into the center of one of the two by six plies versus where one of the intersections are or where they're, they're laminated together. Now it'll be fine, but in my head, if I can get that into the middle of one of the two by six plies, I feel like at the end of the day, that's gonna be a better connection. So I'll uh, just do them at an angle, one in the middle, one in each corner. All right, so the next thing we do, we're just gonna kind of work our way up is attaching window boxes and door frames. So what we'll do with window boxes is we frame up a box. We screw that box together with three and a half inch uh, screws. There's a lots of different manufacturers out there. The, this is actually uh, Gripfast, which is a Menards brand. They're a lot, they're a really good screw. You will find like a GRK and there are some other brands that have like a cutting head on them that really go in nice and easy. What we use is a coated screw uh, that just resists rust, all that kind of good stuff. So we will screw our window boxes together, our door frames. And then when we put them up against the girts, we will use two three and a half inch nails at each uh, intersection where the window box touches a girt. So if this is, the edge of my frame and I have a girt going this way, we will run two screws into each connection. So all of our window boxes, door boxes are screwed into the girts. They're not nailed. I like to screw them. It pulls it up nice and tight. And it's just kind of the way we do it. If you have to move it or whatever, it's easy to pull those screws out. But that's how we attach all of our window boxes and door frames. One thing I forgot to mention, um, outside of the girts, we use a two by 12 grade board. And the reason for that is kind of the way I lay out my building, how I put my insulation, my five inches of concrete. That two by 12 grade board gives me plenty of space for all my trims to be nailed above where the finished floor is gonna be, below, all that kind of good stuff. And when 
We nail that on. We'll initially just run a screw into each connection just to hold it up there. And then we'll go back with our nail gun and use the four and a half inch ring shanks. And in a two by 12, I'll typically put um, eight in a connection where they overlap four on each side. That is plenty uh, to hold that on. And it gives you a, a real good structural connection with that two by 12 grade board at the bottom of those columns. And now we're gonna move up to how we attach our trusses to the frame of our structure. So we will use columns spaced eight foot on center. We will remove the center ply and set our truss inside that center ply. And that's inside the building. On the two outside edges, those trusses get face nailed. So we'll start there. So we'll put our first truss up, which is an end truss, and that will get face nailed into all of the columns. And those columns I run from the footing all the way up to the top cord of the truss. That way we have plenty of strength all the way up to the top cord. And again, we will use the four and a half inch ring shank hot dip galvanized nails. And we will put anywhere that truss has a board that intersects that column, we nail it with these. And so as far as that end goes, that is plenty of nails to hold that truss on there. I mean, you're getting a ton of nails in there. Typically, I'm trying to think how many we'll run. We'll probably run eight to 10 into the actual end columns. And then if you have a two by four cross member on the truss going in, we'll run two of these in. And that truss is gonna be good and solid. If you need to suck that truss up to the column, we'll use a structural lag. Obviously this is uh, not the right length, but we'll use a structural lag to go through the truss and suck it into the column and then we'll nail it. Um, and then you can just leave this if you want. If you can get it uh, flush with the, with the truss, you can just leave that in there. Now, as far as the center trusses, so your common trusses, like I said, we will take out apply, get them set to where we want. And then again, we will run ring shank, four and a half hot dig gal galvanized into both sides. A lot of times uh, if that, um, a lot of times if the column is kind of spread out, we'll suck it together with structural lags so that when we put our nails in, we're getting good contact there. And then once our structure is built, we have the roof on and we know it's good and square. If you want to add a lot of structural strength to your building, you can run a through bolt through the column, through the truss and out the other side and tighten it down. And that really sucks and clamps that column down around that truss and gives you, it really alleviates a lot of movement and it's gonna give you added uh, wind resistance, added uplift resistance uh, to make a really structurally sound building. And the thing with that, you can use a carriage bolt like I have here, or you can use a normal uh, bolt and just have a washer on the end. It doesn't matter. Uh, we use half inch when we do that, and that just sucks that all together. All right, so now we're gonna move to the purlins. We use, uh, since our base spacing is eight foot on center, we have to stand our two by four purlins on end. If we had a truss spacing of four foot on center, we could run our purlins flat. But typically all of our builds are eight foot on center, so our purlins will be on edge. And those are fastened with six inch 60D ring shank hardened nails. So you can't uh, cut these with a sawzaw or anything. They are super, super hard. Uh, it does take quite a bit of energy to drive these in. They're six inches. So if you think about a three and a half inch um, two by four, you have two and a half inches that's gonna go in to your truss. Uh, and that's what holds your truss and your roofing, or holds your purlins and your roofing system to your trusses. They do make a structural lag that is approved to screw your purlins to your trusses, which if you are a self builder, that might be the option that you wanna take. They are quite a bit more expensive. It looks similar to this, only at six inches and you screw them in. So I think it's a lot easier to keep that screw straight going in there than a nail. Uh, these nails have unbelievable holding power, but the screw will give you more holding power in the end. 
I think uh, as far as a DIY standpoint, it's gonna cost you more money, but it's going to be easier for you to uh, run those in uh, straight. Some of the problems you're gonna run into when driving these is you have to start these straight. Once they have started their course, they're not gonna change it. So you have to make sure you're going in straight. Um, Cause if you're at an angle at all and you hit a grain, it will pop it out the side. And you gotta think this is what's holding your purlins to your truss. So you wanna make sure you have good connection in there. A couple things to mention when you're, uh, when we're back, go back to trusses. If you're gonna run your trusses four foot on center, or say you have a truss that lands over a garage door. Um, in that case, you're gonna have to run a header the length of your building or at a garage door, you're gonna have to run a header over the top. Uh, we will fasten those headers with the four and a half inch ring shank nails. And then if you are doing trusses four foot on center, you're gonna have to build stub columns. And the stub column is just that, it's a short column that you pre-build that just gives you a pocket to sit your truss in. And then again, you're gonna, you're gonna fasten that the same way. Now, if you do truss this four foot on center, you can lay your purlins flat, which eliminates you from having to use the 60D six inch ring shanks. You can just use a nail gun. I would still use three and a quarter inch ring shank nails, and you could put two in each connection and you would have a really nice solid uh, roof system. So now that we have all of the trusses on, the next step is to add fascia boards. We use two by six fascia, so two by six fascia boards, and we screw all of those on. So we'll use the three and a quarter or three and a half inch coated screws to screw them on. We'll put two in each connection. If wherever we have a two by six connection point, so where two by sixes butt together on that truss tail or overhang jack, whatever you're using, I laminate a two by six on each side of that point. So instead of having three quarters of inch of bearing point, I'm adding an inch and a half to each side. That way that fascia board is really good and secured uh, to that truss. Uh, you'll get a lot better result, longevity out of your fascia. Uh, so that's how we attach all of those. And then after that, we will square the building and start putting our sheathing on typically. Uh, at this point, we are sheathing all of our roofs with half inch OSB or similar material. And the way we're fastening those down is with, uh, these are two and five sixteenths ring shank galvanized nails that we shoot out of a cordless framing nailer. And whatever sheathing material you're using, you just wanna make sure you look at what their specs are, how many nails they say to use per uh, row. Uh, typically it's, you know, eight, eight inches on center in the middle and on the edges, it drops down to six inches. Um, but we use all ring shank. We don't use smooth shank just because it gives us a lot of extra strength. So that's pretty much wraps up the structure. The only thing else we add is over our roof sheathing is we will add a synthetic. You can use a synthetic uh, roofing paper, which we just staple down. We don't use cap nails because we're putting metal on it and those will show through the, the metal if you use those. So we just use staples. You do wanna make sure that you get those nailed flat because if they're sticking up, it will show through the metal. Another thing you could do is you could use ice and water shield over your whole roof. Then you don't have any staples or anything on there. That's a good option. Uh, I'm gonna cost you a little bit more money, but at the end it might be better. When you run your screws through, they kind of self heal around that material. It's a pretty heavy uh, uh, material that the ice and water is made out of. So. Once we get that done, our roof will be squared and then we will attach uh, the metal on our roof. If you're using an exposed fastener, uh, we use the inch and a half uh, sheet, uh, metal screws. These actually have a self drilling head. There are, there are a lot of different types of these screws. They have the metal washer with the rubber seal on them. Um, you know, a lot of people get worried about using these, but we have really good luck. You know, when you're tightening these down, you want to watch this washer. And once your metal is seated to your pearl or to your sheathing, as soon as that rubber washer starts to expand, you're tight enough. You don't want it to squash the washer out and you obviously don't want it to be too loose. 
but we've had good luck with these. It's just a matter of uh, paying attention to that water, making or washer, making sure your steel is sucked down. We screw in the flats on our roofs. I know there's a lot of people out there say that's a no-no, but when you think about um, your steel, especially if you don't have any sheathing on there prior to your steel, all of your structural strength comes from that metal. So you wanna make sure you have intimate connection between the metal and your purlin to give you that shear strength. And if you're going through the ribs, there is about three quarters of an inch to an inch gap between where your screw goes through the metal and hits the purlin. So that what that allows is there to be a little wobble in, in that screw if you get really windy days or whatever. Another thing I wanna mention is even though we're sheathing our roofs with half inch OSB, we are marking out all of our purlin locations with chalk lines and making sure our screws go through the steel, through the OSB and into the purlin. Um, that, is, that is crucial in you know, the longevity of your roof. The OSB just isn't um, meant to hold that down, in my opinion, and you're gonna get a lot better results, a lot letter, better longevity by running those screws into the purlin. Uh, we'll, keep, we'll just continue with uh, the metal now. As far as like our ridge cap, uh, all, of our, all of our steel gets attached with the inch and a half uh, metal screws color matched. The only place we use two inch screws, it's the same screw, it's just two inches versus inch and a half is through our ridge cap and um, also I believe our snow bars. Snow bars will have a little bit bigger diameter screw. But the reason this is two inch, because your ridge cap gets set over the top of all your ribs. You put a closure strip down and then your uh, ridge cap gets put on and then there's a screw goes through the ridge cap, through each of the ribs, and then down in to your sheathing and top purlin. So we have to have this a little bit longer because there's that three quarter inch gap there inside your rib that we have to go through to hit uh, solid wood. Um, it's important that that, um, whether you're using sheathing or not, that you run these not through just the steel, but into the purlin. For attaching all of our trim, so when we start trimming out our building, we'll start at the bottom, which is the square base. We have our double angle, which is our wainscot trim, all of our um, J trims. We use a coil roofing nailer with inch and a half roofing nails. That's how we nail down all of our trims. Uh, there are some staple staplers out there that will be powerful enough to shoot staples through if you wish. I just find we get good results uh, with the roofing nailer. And that's how all the trims get fastened on. So the only place we won't use these roofing nails is obviously our fascia and garage door trims. We will get color matched uh, trim screws. They do make trim nails. But what we use is these color matched trim screws. And I like these because if you need to take your trim off to adjust it or it's not sitting right the way you like it, it's real easy to get these off. These, uh, these are, uh, I think, a T5 or T10 head, so a real small uh, drive, but they are really nice to use. Uh, like I said, if you have to take your trim off, you can get it off. If you, if you use aluminum trim, trim nails, it's almost impossible to get them off without uh, damaging your trim. So we use these in all of our garage door trims. So like our um, sliding door trim that goes through the jam, we'll, we'll use these to secure it. We'll use these in our uh, fascia. And we don't use a lot of these. The less, the better. I mean, you obviously have to have enough in there to hold it on there, but you don't wanna put too many because you're gonna add a lot of extra ripples in your fascia and all that. Now your fascia is going to get covered with gutters typically or uh, sidewall tr or corner trim, but you don't want to use too many of these. As far as how we attach our soffit, you can use a couple different things. You can use, if you don't have a stapler, we'll use a stapler to attach our soffit. We slide it into the FJ and staple it. You can use these trim screws. You can even, um, take these washers off or leave the washers on and run one of these inch and a half screws in through one of the valleys because you gotta think your fascia trim 
is going to come down and it's going to cover this screw and you're never going to even see it. So you could even use these if you wanted. So there's lots of options on attaching your soffit. All right, so I guess the last thing that we're going to talk about is how uh, wh what fasteners we use on our porches. So we'll just go from the top to the bottom again. So we will pour piers for all of our post locations. We'll use a six by six wet set bracket. And typically we use a six by six green treated post. Uh, all of our porches, we build post and beam style. So if you are using a six by six cedar, that's gonna be true six by six. So you will have to plane a little off of each side to get it to fit in a six by six bracket. I like to use the west set brackets because I like that um, bracket coming up that high and having that really good connection. We won't run through bolts, we'll just run structural lags in from each side so we don't have that big bolt sticking out on each side. I think it looks a lot nicer. You can paint the brackets and if you think about where you're going to have the most uplift on a house, that's going to be under your overhangs and under your porches. Wind's going to be able to come in and come up so you want a good connection there. That's why we use the, the wet set brackets there. We'll set all of our posts, um, get our uh, lags in there. We'll run our structural lags into each connection. We'll come back and add um, the through bolts. Instead of the through bolts, we'll add structural lags later. Then we will set our beam, which is the same size. So if we're using a six by six post, we're gonna be using a six by six post as our beam. And how we attach that is with 10 inch structural lags. So we'll use uh, two of these in each connection. So where a beam overlaps a post, we'll run two of these down in there. They're 10 inches. So you're getting down into your uh, post about four inches, maybe a little bit more. And then where you have two beams butted up together over a post, we will run two on that one and two on that one. Um, once these are in there, it's, uh, it's going to be really solid. As far as where we attach our beams to the house, we run a two by 12 or double two by sixes along our structure to attach our beams to. You want to make sure you have a good solid, uh, connection point. Typically our posts will line up with the columns on our house. And then we will use these. This is a Simpson U HUC 66. So this is a HUC 66. And the reason I like these is because it's a structural bracket, but instead of the flange coming out, it comes in. So this is all hidden. Once you nail this in and we'll use uh, three and a quarter inch uh, ring shank nails to nail this into our structure. And then we'll nail through the side into our uh, beam. And that will give you a nice solid beam that comes over and connects to your house if you choose to uh, mount your beams to your house like that. I like to do that on my ends because it looks real nice or in front of an entry, I'll run two back to the house and that's what we use to connect to our house. So once you have the main structure, your posts and your beams all put together, we use all two by six sub rafters and two by 12 rafters to frame up the pitches of our roof. Typically we run about a four and a half pitch. Um, those get connected to the house with three and a half in, or three and a quarter inch nails. And then we will use a little L bracket on our beam, which I don't have any here. I think Justin probably be able to cut away to show you. It's a little L bracket. They will attach to the beam and then attach to your rafter and sub rafter. And then on our porches, we have went to doing all dropped purlins. And the reason I do that is because when I cut my rafter, I can just dye my rafter in all the way to the end of my sub rafter, which I acquire my overhang with. So I don't have to figure out um, how far back that rafter needs to die using purlins on edge. Um, so we will use overmount purlin hangers. Uh, these are, the number on these are JDS 24. These are made by uh, MeTech or MyTech. I don't know how you pronounce that. So this will go over your rafter, gets nailed in, and then your purlins hang in these brackets here. And then you have to use uh, the three and a half inch or three and a quarter inch ring shank nails is what we use that go through the bracket, 
through the purlin and into the rafter. And so from that point, once you get all your purlins on, where our purlins die into, if you're using a hip corner on your porch, uh, we will die our two by four purlin right into the edge of that and then toenail it into that hip rafter. And then where it dies into the house, we just use a normal two by four hanger. And then all of our porch roofs get sheathed with half inch OSB. We attach that the same way with the two and five sixteenths ring shanked galvanized nails. And then the metal and all that gets attached the same way as we do on the house. So guys, that's gonna cover all of the fasteners that we use for our to complete our structure. I don't think I forgot anything. If you guys have any questions, leave them in the comments. We'll do our best to answer them. We will leave a description um, of each of these fasteners in the description of this video so you guys can easily find them. Hopefully that'll be helpful to you. As always, we appreciate you guys watching. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, share us with your friends, and we will catch you on the next video.